trade number or something or the other. It might be 63. I think it's 63. I think Tim and Chuck think it's 67 or 65 or something like that. But um, they're counting the redos. I'm not counting the redos. So we're going to cause... We're gonna cause a lot of problems in the future as we get the numbers all mixed up. The more we do redos, we'll <laughs> we'll get all confused. Uh, but that's just the way it is. Uh, I assume that we are live. I assume I've got sound. Tim, you with me? Tim has been losing internet, and Chuck is still on the road. So um, there you go. Am I shouting in the dark? Tim, we're good. All right, Commander Pete, can you <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> How's it going, Mark? I will assume that I've got sound and video. Uh, hey, Rhino, how's it going? All right, good deal. So Tim's still up in the mountains, of course, and and uh, he's, uh, we all here in Arkansas, we're all having internet problems. They, I've, I'm supposed to have a new modem headed this direction at some point, but uh, I, was on, I was on the phone with uh, Comcast yesterday for about an hour and 45 minutes, on hold for about an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, how's it going, Willie? <laughs> how's it going, DM? And uh, very delightful woman, very, very nice woman got on the phone, and we chatted for about 20 minutes, and the upshot was they were going to send me a new modem because ours had, we, we'd lost internet service, I don't know, 12 times in the past day or so. And she said, you will be receiving a text notification from whoever within 10 minutes of this phone call. Just look for that and then set up your scheduled delivery, blah, 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 blah. That was about 30 hours ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, not so sure that 10 minutes meant the same in my. Maybe she's on troll time. Trolls are always late for everything anyway, so. <laughs> so maybe it just works out. Ooh, it's hot. That turned the fan. <sighs> All right, Tim's with us. There we go. <laughs> Tim, I'm assuming we're going to lose you at, at some point. In the course of this conversation, <laughs> I think you've lost it twice today, haven't you? There you go. Learn by doing, yeah. <laughs> Unsupervised Steve is a bad thing. I am going to try. I've noticed that I've started cussing a little bit more on these <laughs> on these streams. I'm going to try to ramp that back a little bit. Uh, it's very natural for me. I don't know why. Uh, three years in the army, and my dad was in the army too, and. Uh, just a lot of cussing. <laughs> yeah, clean it up. Just a lot of cussing. Oh, uh, and not for any particular reason. You know, occasionally there was a reason, but mostly it's just, uh, I don't know, emphasis? Is that is that what it is? How's it going, George Fields? Uh, I, I guess that's why you, you cuss. And my dad did say something to me once. He said, uh, you know, uh, I cuss, meaning him, not me. He said, I cuss a lot less when there's no one around. And I thought that was the funniest kind of self-awareness that I've heard in a long time. And it's true, if, no one, if nobody's around, what's the point in cussing? I still do it, but uh, it, loses a, it loses a lot of its, uh, it loses a lot of its, you know, whatever, uh, purpose or something like that. George, it's been a long time. Glad you could join us. Uh, <laughs> we... <laughs> I sent my wife some Always Sunny in Philadelphia clips for her to, to enjoy <laughs> in her, the waning hours of her afternoon. He, she doesn't normally go in for, for that type of humor, but uh, she's appreciated a little bit of it recently. My friends and I can work the, the S word or F word <laughs> or the word, but only the F. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't know. It's not even a cuss word anymore. I think it's just emphatic expressions. That's all it is. Cussing can be an art form, yes. My dad was very good at it, Vic. He could just, man, he could just string, it was like music listening to my dad cuss. He could just, just string stuff together like it was nobody's business. <clears throat> With the right emphasis, and you know, it's just good. Eh. I, I, you know, I've got a rule for my kids. They, they can cuss, I don't really care. They just can't do it around elderly people, uh, young people, and um, around, this is my southern coming out of me, around women. Um, so, uh, of course, <laughs> my daughter can let off quite a quite a string of words when she's <laughs> when she's irritated. Colorful metaphors. There you go, right now. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> silly Fanny. Yeah, you know my mom never cusses, but she would say, "What was it, shit, Miss Kelly?" If if she if she said, 
shit, Miss Kelly, you knew the world was ending. Something had occurred. Uh, she just never cussed in the... I wish you could let that one go, and you knew. Just run. Get out. All is lost. Davis never learned that. He always got... He always got caught up in something. I love Bless Your Heart. My wife does that very well. My wife's very Southern, and she's got that... That whole... My daughter, too. They both have got that... I don't know. W wicked mean streak that seems so very nice, and it's really not. Um, it's absolutely hilarious. I need to continually remind my wife that she should be more careful with her language, but most of the bad words are in Portuguese. That doesn't count, right? Yeah. So long as no one can understand it, you're good, right? <laughs> That's the way that works. Though I suspect uh, Portuguese is pretty close to Spanish, would be my guess. <laughs> so there's probably more that understand that than, than you would would hope or, or fear. Uh, my family has that. Well, aren't you sweet? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we got that quite a bit. I don't, I think... Uh, MF and SOB have to be my my go-to uh, my go-to expressions when I'm angry. Those are the ones that that and CK uh, they just hmm CK Castle Keeper though not Castle Keeper this <laughs> this for this discussion. There was a pipe uh, pipe major and a bagpipe band I used to hang with. He could form a person. <laughs> this is profanity. That's awesome. Yeah, some people some people are gifted that way. They're just. It's a gift, and they should express it, right? That's that's what we're about. We <laughs> express the gifts that we are given. Remember when Kenneth and I used to come up with all the words? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my good God. <laughs> I would sit in the back of that car while you two were driving, while you were driving, and Kenneth's up there. And you all would sit for just a mile after mile after mile coming up with whatever <laughs> whatever name of the body part. Quite entertaining. I wish I could have... Uh, um, I wish I could have... Um, Tape recorded those. Those would have been great to listen to as we <laughs> sit on the river and do a little fishing. Uh, CK, so, um, wait, did I say that wrong? No, CS, I'm sorry, not CK. <laughs> CS, that's the one, King Cothar. Yeah, not CK. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wicked one. How's it, yeah, how's it going, Geek Preacher? Hey, man, you need to let us know whenever you're, because you're, I know you're getting on to, to Twitch, and I've seen some of your TikTok stuff, very cool, over on Instagram, but when you're doing your Twitch stuff, uh, Geek Preacher, Hit, hit the trolls. Hit my Facebook page. Hit us up. Let, let everybody know you're doing it. Uh, I like to stop and watch your sermons every now and again whenever I see them pop up. Thoroughly enjoyable. Love it, love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got the initials wrong on that, King Cother. It makes a little more sense to see us. <laughs> you complete Will Bear. There you go. The best thing about real English is that anything can... Yeah, no kidding. Actually, I kind of like that. What did I say yesterday, Tim? Paddy wagons or something? I can't remember. Apple wagons? Apple? I don't know what I said. When Derek blesses your heart, he means it. And this is true. Just choosing a random word there is an example. <laughs> what? No, well, I'm already... Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Let us know. Let us know. Just spam the crap out of us. It's good. I spam you enough with my goobly goop, my troll stuff. So, so <laughs> absolutely feel, <laughs> feel welcome to spam my stuff. Yeah, Chuck is, Chuck is extremely helpful. He's, he's made this happen, so... He and Tim, but Chuck, Chuck was extraordinarily helpful. Tim pushed it in this direction because I was I was like an anchor on the uh, <laughs> an anchor on the bottom of the river, just dragging. So Tim pushed us forward, and uh, Chuck did the the grunt work, and got us on it. We still got some improvements to make, but uh, I think overall it's going pretty good. Um, I like the whole setup. It's it's easy for me. I know he's talking about changing some of it, but uh, as it is right now, it's pretty easy for me to just dive in. And tackle it and and get rolling. <clears throat> Hot paddle wagons. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever strange uh, consortium of words tumbles into my brain pan. But we are here uh, not to discuss. Uh, wait a minute. And so my friend told me a month ago that he was making his own game engine from the ground up, and I warned him uh, how mind-numbingly awful it would be. <laughs> the other day he called and told me he had no idea. Yeah, yeah, King. It's uh, I remember the the days that we were, and, and I'm gonna say we, but it's really Davis and Matt Golden. Uh, we were developing the Siege engine. Oh my God, it went on for seemingly forever, uh, and even for a mechanic as simple as a Siege engine, it seemed to go on forever. But uh, and it was lots of just, just discussions about percentages and and just stuff, stuff that I don't care about. 
of course, I, I recused myself from all mechanical discussions in CNC. That was... Yeah, it is like doing your taxes every day. You should see somewhere around here, I've got the files of Davis's original equations for the siege engine, and he really wanted to put them in the, the CKG, and I, I said, absolutely not. We're not putting that in CKG, because it really, it's literally just equations of <laughs> what the odds are. I don't know what it is. I had looked at it in 10 years, but uh, it's really just, it's not good. It's not good. Not good. Yeah, and nobody wants to do their taxes once uh, a year, much less once a day. But we are here for Jim's Tricks of the Trade, number 63. Uh, we are talking about starting new players. Uh, this is going to be kind of a, a thematic thing I think I do for the next couple of weeks, unless I get bored. But um, uh, So I think next week we might kind of stretch out into bringing players back to the table who have already been there. That kind of touches into the, to the losing players that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. But these are just some thoughts I had on how to kind of integrate someone who's new to the game. I've had to do that a lot in recent years as as I've stepped up doing more convention events. Well, before all the conventions were canceled, <laughs> as I began stepping up doing more convention events, um, the uh, I started to have more, new, more and more new players at the table that hadn't played Castles and Crusades and were coming from, from whatever game they were coming from, Dungeons & Dragons or swords and wizardry or dungeon crawl classics have you ever noticed how i really only say those three those are the only three games aside from castles and crusades and amazing adventures that i actually that I actually know and that's the, that's the reason they're the only ones i say <laughs> i should really branch out and look at some of the the other there's tunnels and trolls i guess that's one of them um isn't there labyrinth labyrinth lord labyrinth lord i think there's a labyrinth lord out there uh something like that the latest Kickstarter for CNC. This is a big one. Oh yeah. Oh, is that that's the uh, that's the the landing page. That's right. Uh, yeah, go check that out. And if you haven't seen the uh, uh, old school essentials, that's the one. I was actually talking about that earlier today. I just I couldn't remember the name of it. So. <laughs> but whatever game that you're coming from, um, it, you know, this is kind of what we're talking about with with bringing new players in. This is what we're talking about today. I completely sidetracked myself. Uh, but we're talking about today bringing new players into the game, uh, whatever one, whatever game system it is that you prefer to play, <sighs> whether you're old school essentials or swords and wizardry or dungeon crawl classics. Oh yeah, there's a it is right now. There is a an, just an ass ton of RPGs out there. There's so and I gotta tell you, it was weird too when I first went to Gen Con in 2000. I, I'd been going to Dragon Con for years. When I first went went to Gen Con in 2000, I was absolutely floored at the sheer number of not only RPGs but games in general. I had no idea. You know, I go to game stores, but I don't really I never really paid much attention to the to the noise around. I'd just go to the D and D section in those days and get whatever and move out. Miniatures, dice, whatever. But yeah, the the number of, of games out there and now with Kickstarter of course and giving uh, a lot of people a platform to actually try to get their game into the market. Um, it's just it's cool. I mean it's just there's just games everywhere. I've had to break down and pick up more 5e stuff simply because it's becoming an, it's become a necessity. That game seems to be holding its own. I gotta say, she's uh, what are we five years into 5e? She's she's holding her own pretty good. Uh, I I think across the board we're seeing a decline in sales, but nothing that you know nothing's going sort to of kill the brand or anything like that. Though I'm hearing I'm always hearing rumors. Uh, I'm already hearing rumors of a sixth edition you know, floating around. If you want that image you've been posting everywhere for the new Kickstarter as a poster, please. It's, it's getting a ton of love. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely going to be a poster. There's no doubt. Uh, it will definitely be a poster. i got to decide what type of poster. At first, I was going to do um, just, you know, a regular poster on poster paper or whatever. Um, but now I'm kind of thinking a little bigger. That thing turned out so much more beautifully than I expected it to. I mean, Jason's a fantastic artist. Uh, he, he's, he always does a great job. I love his art. But that one just really... I mean, it. it I, when I opened it up this morning, it was the first thing I got this morning when I clock in at 7.30. Uh, I went to the email, and there it was. And um, he's out in uh, out in Western Canada, and, and I opened that thing up. And sweet goodness, I was I was absolutely floored. Sent it to Tom Tullis immediately over at Fat Dragon Games, because not only is he he's a good friend of mine, but he's a huge fan of Jason. So I immediately sent it to him, and he went ape shit too. So it's just a great, it's a fantastic cover. Uh, cover absolutely. We're entering year six. Okay, there you go. So that, that's really good for an RPG. And it's really good for a D&D &D RPG. 6E is likely coming. Just watch the Wizard of the Coast job notices lately. 
<laughs> They're obviously gearing up for something big. That's what I'm thinking. Um, same here. I'm hearing rumors about 6E. Personally, don't think it's a great time, but hey, I'm just a fan. Yeah, who knows? I mean, it's it, all of these companies, TLG, Goodman, they all have to make decisions based on you know revenue and all this other crap. Uh, so they'll do what they have to do. Hopefully it's as good as 5e and they don't do anything to really upset the apple cart. They've got a good game here and uh, I'd really like to see them push this game into a broader market and they've done a fantastic job at that, but just push this game to a broader market as as opposed to splitting this this um, this fan base. And, and that's what they're going to do when a 6e comes out. You're going to have a lot of people who go to 6e, but a lot of people who stay with 5e. Uh, and you split the fan base. It was one of the reasons. There's this great Dragon article. I've talked about it before that Gygax wrote way back in the day in the early 80s, and his thing was there will never be a second or third or fourth edition of, of uh, Dungeons & Dragons because as soon as you do that, you split the fan base, and uh, then you got it to either abandon one game or support two games or, in our case, six games. Uh, and I mean, he's dead on. And it's that, it, that article is actually one of the underlying foundations of Castles and Crusades, because when I read it, it made such sense to me uh, that I was determined at that point, and when I talked to Mac and Davis when they were developing the Siege Engine and all that crap, uh, that we're, this, this is a one-shot. We're done. Once we've done this, if you want to do a different role-playing game, we're going to do a different role-playing game, but this is this is Castles and Crusades, and we're going to stick with it, and we have. We, we have not changed that game. The fundamentals of that game have not changed in 15 years, which sounds just... Is that right? Yeah, 15 years. Good God. That's crazy. Yeah, six to eight years sounds about right. It, it, Retro Gamer, you're dead on. It is a perfect time to introduce 5e gamers to, to CNC, and I'm hoping that the Kickstarter coming up helps us do that. Uh, we're going to dive into that like crazy on October 12th. It'll be more like 5.5, an alternate set of a death. That's, that's what I'm thinking they're going to do. I can't imagine that they're going to abandon 5e and, cre and create another mechanic. I just can't imagine them doing that. They've got a good mechanic here. It's very much like my own, so <laughs> so you know, it's a good one. Um, well, yeah, that's the the thing with uh, keeping these games fresh is kind of difficult. Obviously, Castles and Crusades has a much broader market to build into, uh, so it's easier for CNC. But um, you got to do. I mean, you got to add stuff to it. You got to bring things to the table, and they're in my mind. They really aren't. One of the things I I'm very proud of TLG for doing. We've got a lot of different stuff. Uh, in here. I mean, the Mythos series alone is six huge books that can give you all kinds of new playing material with the same siege mechanics. It's just good stuff. Uh, in my experience, modern gamers are versed on running new systems. The whole point of 5e is simple accessibility, which opens the game up to players who wouldn't otherwise bother, which is a good thing. However, that does kind of shoot them in the foot when it comes to continuing to new editions. Yeah, that's part of the problem with RPGs is they have they have certainly set the tone that to rejuvenate themselves every three to six years, they have to come out with a second edition so that they can get new players, but the new markets share and, and new exposure at shelves and all of that stuff. Um, but also, they know their loyal fans will follow. I think that there's there's kind of a flaw in that system, I think. Uh, really, it might behoove them to look into new avenues and expand the game into new avenues, uh, whether that's movies or comic books or today's video games or whatever. Uh, it might be something that otherwise you can do, and then you expand here and you kind of pull people into your main RPG. And it's all very, it's it's all very uh, tangled. The way retailers, the distribution distribution market works, all these things. It's one big mess, and it's there's no easy solution to any of it. It's easy to, for me to sit here and say Wizards of the Coast should do this. Uh, chances are, there's a really good chance they've tried multiple different things, uh, and it worked with varying degrees of success, what have you. So, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a big bag. Six editions of D&D, counting original D&D over 46 years means 7.6 years per edition. Yeah, now, I'm not sure. Are you counting? There's a 3.5 kind of jammed in there. I'm not sure if that, that includes that. Well, technically, AD&D was first day. So if you count D&D, then a seven editions. Wait, I'm not allowed to count the... <laughs> it, gets, it gets all kinds of confusing, <laughs> however you define whatever. Um, all right, but let's dive into GM's Tricks of the Trade. Uh, today, we'll just kind of barrel into that. Uh, this fan is this fan's killing me. I'm going to turn it off. I'll turn it off. All day my office was cold. Now it's warmed up. It's late in the afternoon, so the, the, the heat's kind of permeated through everything. All right, so today we're talking about bringing new players to the table, and specifically we're talking about players who have never played the RPG of choice. So whatever that RPG happens to be, you've got someone new at the table, whether it's at a convention or at your house or at a, uh, your local shop, whatever, uh, someone wants to play, and how best to kind of bring them in the table. 
and these are just some thoughts that I had, things that I do. Uh, I'm going to throw them out there, and uh, as always, chew them up. Let's talk about them think, and ideas that you have. When you bring in new players, definitely put it in the, the feed. We'll discuss those. Uh, that's what I love about Jim's Tricks of the Trade. It's really kind of a, uh, all of us sitting around a table and uh, gabbing about how much collective experience do you suppose is, is here? I don't know. A couple hundred years. <laughs> a couple hundred years of collective self GMing experience. Hey, I have a question about the MT binder. I see it comes with the PDF to print pages, but the pics only show the binder. Uh, does it come with a printed copy of all the pages also? Yes, uh, we'll go in and clarify that. I had another person ask that question. So yeah, you get you get the binder, and then you get we print one and hole punch it, uh, and then you get the PDF in case pages tear or, or you want to tear it or whatever. Uh, and that way you can jam it back in. Uh, Tim and I'll get in there and clarify that. We had the, we had another question like that about a week ago. And since 4E came in 2008, then 3.XE was really <laughs> eight years. Man, that's just too, it's too confusing. It's too confusing, Mark. I gotta, <laughs> I'm, I'm checking out of that discussion. <laughs> it's too much. You went to decimals, so I'm done for. Yeah, 200 years. Isn't that crazy? I made it a half century mark living already. That's a pretty good score. So the first thing uh, in this uh, tricks of the trade when we're talking about bringing in new players, uh, starting new players at your table, uh, is, is kind of a, a learn by your doing. I don't ever, when someone joins my table, whether it was AD&D or, um, or Castles of Crusades now, whatever game I'm playing, uh, I don't sit down with them and explain to them all of the minutiae of the rules. It's just um, 200 plus years. <laughs> Nearly ducks the question. No, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, so when they, when, what I try to do is just introduce them to a little bit. Uh, just kind of give them an idea of what's coming. Uh, nothing huge. I don't, uh, I don't spend 30 minutes explaining how all the combat matrices work and the charts that they got to use and the attribute check system or the skill system or the proficiencies or, or any of that stuff. Um, and what I, what I try to do is just give them a, a really quick touch on the mechanics, the, the core for Castles and Crusades. That's going to be the Siege Engine, of course. Uh, everything else I, I, I want to bring in during gameplay uh, and utilize other players to kind of make that happen, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But uh, generally speaking, if you sit down with someone new at the table and you spend 45 minutes explaining rules, they're not going to absorb that stuff by any stretch. Uh, they're going to listen to the first 10 minutes of it and then, um, and then it's going to be the, the Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. I know that's how I am. If you if you're trying to explain something to me, you get to the point, get to the point quickly, uh, so that I can I can get into the game and start playing, and I'll learn as I as I do. It's how we learn to, to ride bikes. It's all of these things. Uh, so what did I miss? Had to welcome the wife home. I think we you missed literally nothing, Gig Preacher. We were we were just talking about. Uh, editions of Dungeons and Dragons. That's all we're talking about. Don't explain the mechanics unless unless they're already a veteran of the hobby. Just describe the soft stuff like the narrative, the tone, the world. Absolutely. That's it, King Kothar. You do not want to bore them down with all that stuff. Uh, most people don't care uh, the percentages. Most people don't care about you know how all of that works. They just want to know that when they get in the car and turn the key, they can go. What did my son say the other day? Driving is literally the easiest thing he's thing he has ever learned in his life and that's true it's, it's just a, a wheel and two pedals um, but there's a whole lot that goes into that right and so but to teach someone to drive them they don't need to know how many horsepower the engine has or what kind of brake pads are on there you don't need any of that crap uh, you should learn it definitely as you go forward learning to drive and you have your own car you should learn all that stuff for safety reasons and the same thing goes for an RPG you're going to learn those mechanics you're going to figure them out those that are important to you, you'll remember, and those that aren't, you won't care about. But to begin with, just, just keep it simple. Absolutely keep it simple. Um, and one of the ways that I do that, of course, and this is what the learn by doing is, so I won't explain, I'm not going to go into the, into the deep mechanics of the game. I'm just going to explain that this is how the Siege Engine works, or whatever system you're using. Um, and then get started playing. As soon as the characters are made, then get started playing. And I'm almost always on a new player, almost always, I'm going to have them encounter something, usually a river, uh, a chasm, a wall, a hedge, something that they have to navigate somehow that's going to require some kind of mechanical check. In, in CNC's uh, world, it's obviously the Siege Engine. Well, it's not obvious if you don't play CNC. It's the Siege Engine, the attribute check system, uh, attribute check system. same thing with Dungeons & Dragons, I think. 
Um, and then and then have them do a few checks. And one of the reasons I choose rivers so often for new players uh, is there's so many things that go into swimming a river. If you want them to, to make an attribute check for every 20 feet uh, and the river's 100 feet, that's five attribute checks. That gets them rolling immediately. It gets them learning the mechanic immediately. And then you can change things up. If they miss one and they're sucked down the river, they can try to grab a, a branch. They can try to do this, you know, all kinds of stuff that they can do. And you try to cut their armor off, whatever it is. Uh, I try to get them so that there's some kind of encounter that they're that they're using the mechan the basic mechanics quickly. Sometimes I use combat for that. Uh, usually not for beginning players, simply because um, it can be overwhelming, especially if they take a lot of damage and get a lot obliterated quickly. Then they didn't learn a whole lot. But when it's something that's that you can control as a GM. Uh, keeping it simple is uh, keeping the encounter, keeping the whatever obstacle that they have to navigate simple and controllable is the best way to do it. I think. Uh, let's see, what did I miss here? Same advice goes for the campaign setting, which you covered in the past. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, absolutely, Rhino. We've talked about that. Don't, don't spend forty-five minutes discussing your campaign setting as much as you want to. I do it. You know, I want to do it too. I got all of this stuff in my head. Um, <clears throat> Hold on to it. <laughs> Just hold on to it. Yep. I drop it I drop it to a choose your own adventure style as set in the world and then prompt for their action. That's it. You really want to get kind of get them just get them going and really and this sounds crazy uh, to a lot of non RPGers, but those of you who are veterans know the truth of it. If you can get people rolling dice, I don't know what it is about dice, uh, but when that it, it's I think it's that if, if I was to dissect it, you know, there's a primor primordial part of our beings, of, uh, of Homo sapiens. We, we lived in the plains forever, running from everything that got near us. And there's chance. And everything that we did, we had to drop out of the tree to go get, <laughs> to go get whatever was on the ground uh, to go eat that dead animal <laughs> that something else had killed. Uh, and there's chance and there's risk. So I think gambling is kind of hardwired into, <laughs> into our whole system. So when they pick up that dice and, and roll it, I think it probably summons some kind of primordial desire of whatever, drive, I guess. Uh, I don't know. So get them rolling dice as soon as you can on something very, very simple. And for the love of God, if you if, you, if your character sheet looks like a tax form, don't show it to them ahead of time. You'll have a vacancy on game day. Yeah. Uh -oh. And I know some of these games, the, the character sheets are five and six pages. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, and it's one of the reasons, I get a little bit of criticism for this. It's one of the reasons at conventions, uh, I don't want pre-generated characters. I want those play... For, now, this is very specific for Castles and Crusades. One of our angles on CNC is the fact that it's very simple to learn, uh, and part of that is character creation process. Um, some of the games, it can take you 45 minutes to two hours to make a character. In CNC, you should be able to make your character in about 15 minutes. And I want them, the new players that sit down at my table, to know that, uh, because you're dead on king. That, man, a character, <laughs> character sheet with shit all over it. You're like, I don't want to do this. I got no interest in this. I have a group of four women that have never played before. They'll be having their first adventure in a few weeks. Oh, Andy, man, that is very cool. That is very, very cool. I love new players, actually, uh, and especially if they're new to the hobby. Uh, and if you women that play the table, and they're nothing like stereotyped or whatever, uh, there turns out they're just as varied as males. They <laughs> Some like combat, some like role-playing, some like this, some like... Turns out women are human too, so <laughs> so uh, you're gonna have fun. That's cool. I, I would definitely keep it simple as you jump in, just because uh, mechanics. You know, people aren't used to it. Mechanics can run them off, male or female. It doesn't matter. And I can tell you right now, if you want me to play a role-playing game, if you sit me down at your table and you, you spend more than 15 minutes explaining the intricacies intricacies of some rule. I'll play because I'm polite, but, <laughs> but I'm not paying attention anymore. That's just the way that is. Mental note, we're water wings in the game with Steve. <laughs> water wings. Yeah, I do a lot of swimming. <laughs> There's a lot of drowning in my in my games. Everything's kind of built around water. I don't know why. Uh, I, just, I don't know why. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. I believe that D&D Beyond has really helped that company grow. By providing a simple, easy to use navigate character takes uh, takes the math, which I like out of picture. Yeah, it's it's a good thing. Uh, I believe now I could be wrong, but the standard five E character sheet's pretty big, isn't it? It's like five or six pages. I want to say that, that I might be thinking of third edition, but I want to say that that's that's the case. 
and most of it three pages. And most of it isn't, you know, it's not germ to what you're doing, I'm sure. Just some of it is. You just got to have all that crap in there. Uh, but, um, yeah, keep it simple. Keep it simple. And 42, you're right. That type of stuff, just easy. Don't chase them off with rules. Uh, teach, them as the, and teach them the game as you start play. Playing. Good Lord. All right. Second page is all RP stuff. I don't know what I'm thinking of. I saw some kind of five-page... Maybe that is third edition. I'm even taking a third edition. Because I know third edition got really complicated for a while there with all the googly goop that didn't went with the game. It's a good game, but not quite mine. How's it going, Clever? Not quite my uh, cup of tea. Uh, more, it was too mechanically driven. <sighs> and we haven't had Bifford in here for a while. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of KPC, I, KFC. I just thought, man, where's Bifford? We haven't seen him in a while. I haven't, I haven't wanted Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because I haven't seen Bifford, because <laughs> he's always in here. I think he works for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, all right, so um, second trick of the trade for bringing new players in is simple as best. So this is, I run into this a lot, uh, especially at conventions. People have never played the game. They want to get into it. They want to play. Uh, I try to steer them to, they always want to play the wizard or the cleric or whatever it is. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> Chuck out did himself on that one. Uh, hey, he's got heraldry at least. <laughs> Smiley face. Uh, they want to play something that's a little bit too complicated. And I should say it's not too complicated. They're going to figure it out, right? They're going to learn all this stuff. We did. They can. It's no big deal. But it's going to drag it a little bit at the beginning of the game. It's going to be... Um, you're going to have to constantly stop and explain how area effect works or whatever it is. So what I try to do is steer them towards something that's very simple. The fighter and the rogue come to, to mind the most... Uh, probably the monk in most systems is a pretty simple class. I wouldn't ever steer them to the assassin because I hate the class so much. <laughs> but that's a personal thing, um, a personal failing of mine. Maybe the bard. Uh, the problem with bards, I ran, I had uh, the young lady who's doing our videos, our promo videos. Man, I forgot to get that. Where's my CNC video? Uh, she started when the first time she gamed with me. She gamed with me and my, my sons, and she started a bard. I didn't think much of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't dislike the bard. I don't ever really think about the bard that much. Uh, it's more of an impacting character than it is an, 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 kind of a passive role, I guess. But um, she played him, played her really well for a while. It was good. She played her really well, and it was really good. But when they got to like fifth level, she there was limitations. Suddenly, she was realizing limitations, and it wasn't as fun. Um, but um, it's probably a good introductory. Because of that, it's probably a good introductory class. She actually switched and started a new character and did a druid. And once she, because she had learned the mechanics, and she and actually she, this is a poster child for this, uh, because she she learned the mechanics playing the bard, got kind of unhappy with the bard, switched characters, and I let her do it seamlessly. I just she was just the same level, different name, different character, just same level and all that crap. Uh, and suddenly she had spells and all these things she could do as a druid, and she just jumped into it like fire. Uh, so it, it's just, if you start them out simple, they can learn the game, and then after five, six, ten sessions, or twenty, whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, when they're comfortable with it, start a new game, or let them switch, or what have you, and then they can get into it, you know, get into the new character, and then really start pushing the boundaries. Uh, I got a big bucket of KFC yesterday, <laughs> to last through the weekend. Yeah, Mark, that's the best way to do KFC, man. Buy it, put it in the fridge, and eat it all weekend. I absolutely love it. They got those new french fries at KFC now. <laughs> Lord forgive me for what I've done. <laughs> nice. I've never had success with steering newbies to simple classes. I think that's something to do with the popular media. Warriors and thieves aren't given the attention in modern fantasy that they once had. had. As a wizard world now. Yeah, that's the, that's the challenge, right? You'll sit at a convention, and especially at my table with 20 people, uh, I'm trying to steer some of the new people away from complicated classes because I know... When it, when it comes around to them, it's going to kind of stop everything as, as someone, myself, or someone at the table has to explain to them, you know, whatever whatever mechanic. And again, it's not, most of it's not that complicated, but it will slow the game some down. So if you can, steer them to something, steer them to something that's simple. And I, I'm with you, King. I think the fighter is really undersold. It still is my favorite class. Uh, it's like... A, I don't know, it's like the little engine that could. It never, it just keeps going. There's no limit. Anything that's going on at that table, there's probably something the fighter can do. So I absolutely love it. Um, magic is for villains. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. 
They just need to know three words, I guess, fireball, right? <laughs> and they do that frequently, <laughs> which I guess is a good thing. That is their purpose. That is the wizard's purpose in the world, is casting the fireball. Bah, fighter just stands there and hits stuff. <laughs> That's what most people think. <laughs> But they can, but at least they can and stuff. <laughs> they get a variety of weapons. I don't know. I just love fires. Uh, I'm a very, if, if I'm ever at your table, I'm a very active player. Uh, I don't, I, I don't do riddles and traps well. <laughs> my characters frequently die when such things are presented <laughs> to me because I can't. I'm just don't. My brain's not wired for riddles. You can say what has three legs when it's old and two legs when it's younger. Whatever the hell that riddle is, I'm like, I don't know, cow. I, my, my brain just doesn't, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't equate that stuff. Uh, so riddles and traps, I'm just going to die, but uh, that riddle is bullshit anyways. <laughs> How does that riddle go? It's like, four legs at dawn, two legs at noon, and three legs at night? Is that, is that, is that what that is? At dusk or something? Something like that. I guess it's presupposing four legs at dawn, two at noon, three at night. Yeah, yeah. So it's presupposing that you're going to have a cane, and then as a baby, see, my daughter. I don't. How would you do this? My daughter never crawled. She she figured out when she the way she became mobile. She would lay on her back and scoot with her legs. <laughs> so she just scooted all over the house. She couldn't see very well. She bumped into things all the time. But after a while, she figured she figured out where the hallways were and where the doors were. She could scoot into things. The, the door jams were funny because she would scoot and she'd bump her head on the door jam as she went over it. But I don't ever remember her crawling. Now, the, the boys did. But uh, at some point, <laughs> in Dawn, there you go. That's how, that, that's how that, that riddle should go for Rachel. Yeah, and the, the boys did, but uh, I don't remember her crawling. She just, one day, just figured out she could stand up and walk. She started walking. Uh, probably about the 49th time she hit her head on a door jam. <laughs> a door jam thought enough of that and I just let her scoot out I don't care however you get around the house is good by me <laughs> I don't care uh, all right so yeah so if you what did we jump into the, oh yeah no we didn't okay so I had actually I moved my thing to number three roll the character stood up and ran right yeah <laughs> she actually she, she did she was she was always a little quicker on learning these things than my boys were my boys just didn't give a shit I just didn't care. They didn't care about learning stuff when they were little. They just figure it out as they go. And I'm all right with it. I think the, fun, I think the funniest thing, and my wife still gets angry at me about this today. So I was out in the backyard killing a nest of yellow jackets. I remember it, and I looked through the window. And I don't know who wants to hear children's stories, but you're going to hear this because it's kind of funny. I looked through the window, and Pete is like five, six, I don't know, four, five, six, something. Um, and Rachel's two years older, so whatever. And they're both standing in the doorway looking at me. And Pete's standing there with his, with his hands like this. And there's blood just pouring out of his head. And it's down his, his cheeks. And it's come down his arms. And it's kind of pulled. <laughs> there's blood everywhere. And they're just looking at me with these shocked looks on their expression. And, of course, as you know, uh, head wounds just blew, bleed ferociously. So I jumped up and ran in there to see what's going on. And I cleaned Pete up. Apparently they had been playing uh, Superman and Wonder Woman. And, and Rachel had tried to to get Superman to fly, so she threw him <laughs> he hit a, some kind of cabinet and busted his head open. But I took him to the bathroom, and um, it just, just there was just so much blood. And I asked him, I, I cleaned him up, and I said, well, do you want to go to the, he's like four, and I said, do you want to go to the emergency room? And he said, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. I said, all right, so I just bandaged him back up and sent him on. He bled for like six hours, <laughs> but it just, kept, it just kept seeping out. My wife was absolutely furious with me. And what made, made it worse, I didn't use a butterfly band. I didn't know there was a, such a thing as a butterfly Band-Aid. I just stuck a regular Band-Aid on his head and sent him back it on his way. So, can you can you imagine a random encounter with pixies that polymorph into a form of human babies? Only they can go into a ditch. <laughs> it's like a kill kittens from Ardu and Gamor. I remember when Davis did that. So Ardu and Gamor is an old, so for those of you who don't know, is an old RPG supplement from the 70s. Great stuff. Fantastic stuff in that book. And um, one of the monsters was kill kittens. And I remember to this day... And my character came up on those cause little bit of kittens in a basket. And I came up to those kittens and they, they leaped out and shredded my character. It was just so funny. Oh, it was the good old days. So, so the, anyway, so what we're talking about. Roll the character. Okay, so once they've chosen whatever class it is, whether it's complicated and hopefully simple, uh, 
now's a good time to kind of to seep rules into it while they're rolling it and drift around give them a couple of pointers on how the attributes work or what hit points are or what how you get armor class up or armor class down or how whatever system it is that you're using uh, and just kind of bleed to those rules that are that are you know germ to the actual character uh, ounce to them while they're making the character sheet. One, it kind of alleviates a little bit of the boredom of making a character uh, until you really know what you're doing and it becomes an enjoyable progress. I know a lot of us, I do, making characters can be a lot of fun. Uh, learning it, not so much. But uh, So just kind of let them know about certain things, armor class, hit points, and what have you. You don't want to overdo it because you, you actually do want to uh, spend a little bit of this time getting things going, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, while they're rolling a character, it's just a great time to learn basic stuff, particularly about the, the combat, uh, particularly about armor class. Uh, it's a great way to kind of just let folks know, uh, you know you're going to roll a d20 to hit this armor class, so is the monster, this armor class is the number they got to get, you know, whatever system it is. Pretty easy stuff that they can get into pretty easy. Uh, how's it going, Green Loontern? Quick side question. Will you be joining Elisa Faden on her stream, making the map for the new CK guide? Uh, we all want you to join. Uh, when is it? Uh, yeah, if I can get into it, absolutely. I absolutely love Elisa Faden's work. I love Elisa. She is such a delightful person. Uh, her Facebook page is one of the few that I actually enjoy going to because it's just all cool stuff. It's just really cool stuff. Tom Tullis, I recommend you go to his because it's just all kind of rough memes <laughs> so you know you gotta have a thick hide over there uh tell us it's just a great facebook page and elisa is just filled with just ships you know planes she put something up yesterday about today at some point about a, some kind of ship sailing over this wrecked world war ii plane it was just awesome yeah absolutely so yeah just let me know when that is i'll, I'll track it down i'll figure out what that is i uh, would love to there's a new map for the ckg and Elisa. she yes commander pete she's doing seven maps i believe or six, I can't remember. She's going to map out uh, uh, Thorpe Village Hamlet? No. Thorpe Hamlet Village Town City in a Metropolis. Um, so th those are going to be... Um, I'll, I'll get a hold of her. Yeah, I talk to her frequently. I get, and I actually need to... We got another really cool project I'm wanting to get started in the next couple of weeks that she and I are going to work on together. Uh, she's just a pure, absolute, pure delight to work with. Uh, I just absolutely... Nothing but good to say about her. Uh, I'll definitely shoot her a message. Thanks for the heads up on that green. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. She may have mentioned it to me, and I, I missed it somehow. Are there any color-coded sheets where the core inputs are coded so it is easy to visually see where they fit in later in the sheet? You know, there's not. But that's a great idea, 42. That is a fantastic idea for um, a character sheet. Uh, make, that, make that important stuff, you know, stand out. And if you could actually equate it to whatever player's handbook that you're doing. Uh, that's really cool. That's an interesting concept, and it's interesting you should bring that up now. I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, 42. If you don't mind me stealing your idea there, you know, we've got the eighth printing of the player's handbook. The Kickstarter is going to launch on the 12th. Um, and uh, color coded character sheets. That's just a good idea. I like it. Uh, and if we get, if we're going to make some pretty big changes to it i think um not the rules all that's going to stay this text is going to stay so if you've got a version already don't you don't need this one uh wait you do need it tim tells me to quit saying that but <laughs> but uh, uh we're going to do a, a, a new layout on it and we're going to have new art in it so it's going to have a slightly different look uh and this would be kind of an interesting an interesting way to do so if we did a like a tab maybe on the armor class section and then that's it's yellow and then it's yellow on the, the character sheet that's an interesting idea yeah making these better can't wait to pick up the new stuff yeah i mean that's I, I like that concept anything to make it a little bit easier uh on new players and old players like myself i mean <laughs> my eyes aren't what they used to be i hate scouring crap so <laughs> yes you need one of everything people yeah Tim has been getting on me for about a decade now to, to quit telling people they don't need stuff. <laughs> it's probably not the best way the best way to sell RPGs, but, but we'll do what we can. All right, so, yeah, so we're on the roll on the character, kind of bleed stuff into it. Uh, and the next one is right in with that, teasing the process. <laughs> this guy's a demon. Uh, right in with that, teaching them how to play the game while they're making the character. Um, once you've done that a little bit, explain to armor class or hit points or whatever, alignment, whatever it is that you've decided to do. 
uh, shift before they're done with that character and start playing the game. Uh, and re the really reason that I, I do this is so if you can get character creation through relatively quickly, or even if it takes a little bit of time, if they feel like they're already playing the game while they're kind of doing this, and they've only been at the table 10 minutes or 20 minutes, or what, the faster, you, basically the faster you can get them playing the game, the better it is uh, for them and you, and the, the less chance of you losing them in, in route. Uh, so I, I, I generally, when I get behind the screen, uh, they're wrapping stuff up, I'll start describing uh, a little bit of information about the setting, uh, the terrain, you're gonna be in the forest, or you're gonna be in the mountains, or whatever. Uh, throw in the weather, just stuff like that, so that um, they're 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 not going to pay attention to a lot of it, but they're going to start kind of absorbing and at least understand that the game has actually begun, even though they're still making their characters. Now it's just a way to kind of tease the process forward, so that you're playing before you're actually playing. Now, and then it gets them already in the mindset. It gets everyone in the mindset of what's coming, whether it's a desert adventure or a sea adventure or whatever. And they can start to start start tooling their head in that direction. Uh, okay, uh, I think this is proof of no one listens to. See. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably a good thing. It's really. I think I'm the most egregious on the CKG because, uh, as you all know, if you play Castles of Crusades, you really don't need the Castle Keeper's Guide. I recommend that you get it because it's actually filled with an ass ton of stuff. Um, I, I used it, and we ran a game, I ran a game last night, and I, I pulled that CKG out three times just for some stuff. And interestingly, I noticed it's missing some stuff that I want to put in this new printing. So it's going to have, what it doesn't have, it, it, it's got a decent little chart for the cost of food and room, uh, you know, room and board. That needs to be expanded. The, the CK needs to be able to go in there, and if there's six players, know exactly how much a six-player room, a four-player room, a three-player, you know, whatever. That needs to be clarified and put in, so that's going to go into it. And then the next thing that they did uh, is they started selling equipment and, and repairing equipment, and I couldn't find it. may be in there, but I couldn't find a chart to tell me. Just give me a baseline of what, uh, specifically, they were sharpening a two-ended sword. How much is this going to cost? So that, that also is going to go in there. I made those notes last night. Um, that stuff's going to go on the new screens when I un untangle that Gordian knot, too. So uh, just good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. PHP and MT are must-haves. Everything else is there. That, at the end of the day, you need those two books. Uh, everything else is extra. And there's great stuff in it. I recommend you get whatever interests you. CKG has just got a lot of good stuff in it, just all the way around. I love the idea of... of for variant rules in the CKG. Yeah, I do too. It, it, when we pull those out occasionally, the only thing I don't use in there is the um, the advantages. I haven't used those much. I, well, a little bit, but not much. Could there be info for a CK screen? Man, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. Uh, I've got to stop now looking for... i got to figure out a different... You know what? That's funny you should say that. My, my brain's in overdrive these days. Too much going on. So, the last we talked about the screens, and I know we're in the middle of GM's tricks of the trade, but let me just give you guys this real quick. Uh, so, the last we talked about the screens, the special Lamy Free paper that went on the outside, we manufactured them here in-house in our print shop. Uh, the Lamy Free paper that allowed them to take water and not get damaged is, is no longer available. So, we had to discontinue that item, and we've been looking to replace it. Found a way to plate, replace it, but the cost is too great. It's not something I really wanted to dive into. If we do, we'll have to do a straight-up Kickstarter and never release it otherwise, and that's I don't I don't like that approach to it. That said, talking to Tom Tullis over at Fat Dragon Games today, uh, he had a great idea uh, of and his was kind of in a different direction, but it played into perfectly that I can use regular paper and then have these things UV coded. So what's going to happen next? Forty-two. I'm going to give my so some of the stuff we outsource to a printer in Missouri, and then a little bit like covers. Cover stock, I don't like the quality that I do in shop, so I outsource that to a local printer, uh, and then they UV coat it. And then we bind and cut and all that crap from there. Uh, so I think, I don't know, um, but I think that we can do these screens, send them to them, and have it UV coated, I think. Uh, it depends on the, the distance between the plate and the, the spray nozzle on the UV coating. Uh, if they can fit it in there. So I will uh, I will shoot her, Vic. Uh, Vic. I'm going to shoot Vicky. Uh, an email on that as soon as this stream is over and ask her if that's even a possibility. So hopefully we'll get some kind of 
resolution on the screens because we haven't had them in stock for six to eight months at this point. Yeah, they green. They need to. Be, I, I, and if not, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to have regular, the the lightweight uh, cardstock screens with laminate on them. I'm just going because this is it's too long, and I'm a huge fan of screens. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marty too. It's good though. <laughs> it's good. I'm getting a pile of notes here that I need to be taken care of. Um, it, it's a very good thing. Uh, please make it easy. At least four panels though, because they're too small to fit in your notes behind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love four panel screens and the the eight and a half by eleven. The, Portrait, right? Yeah, portrait screens. Uh, it's free to sharpen your sword until the blacksmith finds you. <laughs> yeah, there you go, King Kothor. That should be a footnote in there. Well, it's free unless you get caught. So number four here, and did we do? We did tease the process, right? I think we did that. Uh, yeah. So you're just kind of you're kind of bleeding the game into as, as you're as they're finishing up their characters, you're kind of just bleeding the game into. Yeah, we did, did tease the process. So let's dive into the last trick of the trade today. Uh, focus. Yeah. So this is probably. I think we did. Let me <laughs> let me recap real quick. So the idea was, uh, while they're finishing up the character, just go back in there and talk about the terrain, weather, uh, just kind of the basic setting that they're going to be up against, uh, a dungeon, what have you. There's a castle on a hill, whatever it is, just just to kind of get the flavor going, uh, to get them kind of into the game a little bit before while they're wrapping stuff up, which is usually the what equipping the character. I guess name is almost always the last thing people do. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows with me? I can't keep up with this. I can't keep up with what I'm talking about. Uh, so the last one's probably the most important. All those other things are, are cool things that you can do, ways you can kind of manipulate the process, character creation and whatnot. But if you've got new players, try to do your first adventure really focused. Don't build a campaign into it. Don't build any epic themes into it. You can have them. That's great. They can be part of it. Just keep them to yourself. Uh, a simple dungeon of five, six, ten rooms you know, two or three encounters or one big encounter, a little bit of role-playing, just something very, very simple, very focused, uh, so that your the players can get, get into it immediately, understand it immediately, and really, at the end of the day, you want them to succeed. You don't really want them to fail. You want them to succeed at this task so that they can learn the mechanics, learn how the game works, and get into it. And I would say what eight out of ten people get into it as soon as they as soon as there's there's a there's flesh to it they get into it but if you make it too complicated like all of these things if you have all these thematic elements that they're trying to you know they got to take the ring to mount doom and all that crap uh it's it's often too much to begin uh and it leaves this kind of confused taste in their mouths uh so so keep your keep your original adventure your first one probably the first two or three i usually do it for the first about seven eight nine sessions uh just very focused very very focused uh string them together or don't it doesn't matter it's just stuff that's very focused uh what about two three panel screens like the old 1e ad and d screens a super ck screen but waiting until the new ckg is out with all sorts of extra stuff on the additional panels the problem mark is finding printers to do that um there were more 10 years ago most of them have offshored at this point and as you know tlg doesn't offshore we do stuff here uh, so in the United States or Canada or Mexico, um, but um, uh, the problem is finding printers that'll actually do it, and mainly because a lot of these printers they've gone from offset to digital, and digital have as great as digital can be. It's got limitations, tray sizes, all that kind of crap. Um, so you get into this uh, just a different, it's just a different process. It's one reason I liked our screen so much. We had a, we ordered board from Tennessee and we had this Lamy free paper come in from Florida uh, we cut trimmed clipped folded glued all that crap in the shop and it was they're sturdy as hell but we controlled the process completely uh, controlled the price and all that but without Lamy free paper I'm kind of done for but uh, yeah we'll see we'll see we'll, we'll I will keep everyone posted focus a somewhat an ironic tip with <laughs> yeah Oh, irony's good, isn't it, <laughs> Commander? Because this <laughs> this stream never stays focused at all. Uh, I always love when at the first session after character creation, you ask everyone to share their names and describe their characters, and they just look at have <laughs> shock and terror. Oh yeah, the names the worst, but also the descriptions. And I try to I try to go really light, just you know, a, a quick idea of what your character looks like, so that they don't get too uh, overwhelmed with. And then if there's a veteran player who, <laughs> you know, just describing colors and 
where their buckles are and all that stuff, it can be it can be all a little disconcerting. It's one of the reasons I like starting with players on the road. It starts the game going with the slow moments at the beginning, not a, sort of a character discovery. Thing. Yeah, absolutely, 42. I'm an on-the-road guy, too. It's almost always on the road a day or so from a body of water, bridge, something. Uh, because you're moving, and I don't have to worry about a bunch of NPCs. Uh, when you're at a bar, tavern, or whatever, suddenly you're doing auto role playing and I don't really want to do that at the beginning. I want them to do it. And yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it's my favorite place is Outdoors. Yeah, I get the onshore online IMOs for the best only. Yeah, it's, it's really, I'm going to have to devote a few days, I think, to making phone calls and emailing and uh, unraveling this problem. I know, I think, I, I don't think that Goodman offshores his screens. I got to get a hold of Joe, see what he's doing. Uh, but I think he only does the card stock ones. I can't, I can't remember anymore. Um, we're, we're looking at a number of options, but um, short term is I'm going to try to get, get, get our system back up and running. Uh, and if that UV coating that Tullus suggested works, then that's definitely a way to do it. I will say the only problem with the screens doing them in a house is it is a time-consuming process, and the only ones really trained to do it is Mark Sandy and myself. And um, Mark can do it really about twice as fast as I can. He's much better than I am. His his mind is built engineering-wise. But uh, uh, we've never trained Todd or Tim or Davis or uh, anyone else has been trained to to do these screens. It, it, it's time-consuming. Put them in the entrance of a dungeon. Give them a flimsy excuse as to why they are there. Let them choose to enter or not. Then you've got them by the balls. If you if you'll excuse the expression, they'll be more confident in their decision making when they have a limited set of options uh, left, right. No, you're right. That's it. And don't give them this all of this stuff that you want to do. Keep it simple. Keep it focused. They're going to go forward. Uh, don't get into long discussions of why they're adventuring there or whatever. You know the. <laughs> whatever it is don't do any of that uh, just keep it simple simple and focused railroading the plot at times is better than fully open uh, an open world players need direction motivation if they don't understand what the next step or thing is then it gets the game is not fun you know it's funny you should say that too because railroading it's like mega gaming it gets uh, meta gaming it gets um it gets a bad rap and in some instances it is a bad thing you don't want a meta game or a railroad but sometimes you do and as a gm that is you know, that's a great... <laughs> Damn, 42, you're on fire. That's a great GM's tricks of the trade. Um, sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you've got to railroad it a little bit to make the game go forward or to get new players involved or to get discouraged players back at the table or to get people who've left back at the table. Uh, and sometimes the game just sits and no one knows what to do or uh, someone doesn't want to make a decision. I'm running into that a bit lately. It's trying to, to force other players to make decisions. Uh, so the other ones don't feel like uh, a player is kind of running them roughshod. There's times to railroad, definitely. Times to do game, times to railroad. Um, and new new players is almost 90% of the time the time to do it. Because you really just want them to go on the adventure. You, you want to get them started. Once they've started, they're going to learn how to play their character. They're going to learn how to play the game. They're going to learn how to role play. There's so many good things that come out of that um, that... Uh, you just want to get the game going. And that's what all of these tricks of the trade today were about, you know, from quick character creation to uh, going light on the mechanics, learning as you play, all of this stuff is really built uh, to get the game going. And because once they start playing, solving problems, killing monsters, getting treasure, you, you've all experienced that euphoria you get when you slay your... I remember the first work I slew. It was it's back in 1976 or 77. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely get, get the game going. Helps with reading, with keeping focus of the game. Yep. In my experience as a GM, I, I, I use a loose plot line, which feels like I'm not railroading them, even though I am. It's worked for over 10 years. Yep. It's a good point, Green Lantern. Don't just... And, and that actually, the good thing about a loose plot line is that you can shift all of it, too. If they go, you wanted them to go, you know, down corridor A, they go down corridor B, you can... You can shift as well. Uh, if, if you start out with too much stringent stuff, you're going to be disappointed and they're going to be frustrated. Uh, keep it simple. Y'all all broke and you heard that there's some jewels in there. There's abandoned mine. What? Cannibal ghouls? Nah, son, you must have misheard. The mine is abandoned due to tax evasion on the part of the administrator. <laughs> Just shut up and play the game, damn kid. Go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I had to. Todd, actually, and Todd's played for 40 years. <laughs> they had shifted a few weeks ago. They had shifted 
on a different road there, going a different direction. And I think Todd had forgotten. And he said, why are we going to this city? And I said, for gold, glory, and adventure. That's the only reason. We don't need to have a big discussion about why you're going here. No one really cares. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's easy to do. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. All right, well, I think that's it. We've run into This session went super crazy fast. Man. We almost have to expand these things a little bit. But it's 5 o'clock. Uh, that's GM's Tricks of the Trade. If you have not given us a follow, please give us a follow. Uh, we sure so, uh, appreciate any support you can give us. And uh, we'll be back next... Wait, wait, wait. We're doing something tomorrow. we got a convention we're at tomorrow. We're doing GM's Tricks of the Trade at uh, the Greyhawk Con tomorrow, same time. But I, I'm, I will be streaming it here, but we'll also be streaming it over there. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. And uh, I'm in a game with Chuck... Saturday night, and then part of um, Gary Khan's autumn thing next week. And then, of course, Tricks of the Trade next week and AMA next week. So definitely check all this stuff out. Give us a follow. Uh, you'll get all the news as it's coming. <laughs> yeah, that's true, King. We do. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> all right, everybody. Autumn Revel, that's what it's called. The Virtual Greyhawk, that's the other one. Good Lord, I can't, I can't remember any of this stuff. All right, so... <laughs> so Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Sure appreciate it. Love the, uh, the input, uh, and we'll be back next week. Uh, take care. Have a great weekend, everybody.